Ich glaube beides, die NATO und die EU werden... I believe both. NATO and the EU will suffer greatly if this war is truly lost, and I think it's only a matter of months before this war is lost. Then NATO will have lost another war, even though it still thinks it is the largest military alliance in the world. And of course the EU as well, because we will have to pay the money. So Trump's vice president just said that Germany, and perhaps he forgot, Austria, will also have to pay, should pay for Ukraine. That's hundreds of billions coming our way. Hundreds of billions. I mean, it's complete madness. Peace would become insanely expensive. Hello, Hello everyone. Today I want to share a video with you made by my friend and colleague Fritz Edlinger, who is based in Vienna, Austria, and runs the magazine International, international.or.at, where wonderful articles focused on peace and de-escalation are regularly published. Fritz spoke with Michael von der Schulenburg, who was recently elected to the EU Parliament for the Sarah Wagenknecht Alliance in Germany, and now represents leftist politics, or the left in the EU Parliament. Michael von der Schulenburg has been working on de-escalation and peacebuilding for many, many years, and is generally a person with a lot of expertise in conflicts and their escalation. In this video, he talks about the role of the EU in Ukraine. Enjoy. Über die Rolle der EU in der Ukraine. Viel Vergnügen. Schöne guten Tag, liebe Seherinnen und Hörer des YouTube Kanals. Good day, dear viewers and listeners of the YouTube channel of the magazine International. This is Fritz Edlinger speaking again. I welcome on the other end of our system, I assume in Brussels or Strasbourg. In Brussels. In Brussels, our old friend Michael von der Schulenburg. And this is the first time we are speaking in your new role. You can already see it from the official background of the picture. In your office, as a newly elected member of the European Parliament, where you were elected on Sarah Wagenknecht's list. I officially congratulate you, and we have an exciting topic right away. You have already experienced a negatively historical resolution of the European Parliament in one of your first sessions. Also vote against it and even have a brief opportunity to speak, namely the umpteenth tightening resolution on the Ukraine-Russia conflict, on the war in Ukraine. Before I speak at length, I assume you will refer to it anyway and take a position. It is mainly, as we have already published and sent out in Austria, that it has taken another step forward, in the sense that with an overwhelming majority of the European Parliament, it was essentially not only supported, but demanded the fastest possible delivery of long-range missiles for Ukraine, so that Russia can be fully attacked and engaged. Yes, tell me from your perspective how you experienced it, how you experienced the session, and how you assess the significance of this resolution. Yes, so that's my first experience. I arrive here on July 16th, sitting on this terrible chair in Parliament, which is very heavy, and once you sit down properly, you can't get out again. I'm standing there at the table on the 16th with this resolution, three and a half pages, and then it's already being voted on the 17th. There is actually no discussion. And on the 17th, only those who supported this resolution were allowed to speak. I wasn't allowed to speak back then. That came much later and then only for one minute. Yes, well, I've experienced many wars. Yeah, also I have ja viel Krieg erlebt. I don't know if anyone von deinen Zuschauern das weiß. As your viewers know, I worked for 34 years at the UN, mainly at the UN, and was naturally always in war torn countries. So I know a lot about these things. But I have to say, I was really shocked. I was shocked that such a document can be adopted in Europe. This is purely, I would say, a call for total war. There is not a single word about negotiations, not a single word that one might perhaps try diplomatically, not even saying we send weapons, but at the same time try to talk. None of that. Urban in 
At that time, there was, of course, Orban's visit to Kiev and Moscow, and then naturally to China and America, which was sharply criticized. So any form of seeking dialogue between Kiev and Russia is seen there as a betrayal. But above all, it is a resolution that comes at a time when essentially the war is already lost. And that's what makes it so incredibly dangerous. It reminds us we know this from other countries as well. We see that the war is being lost. Then they try to mobilize everything once more. So it's about saying solidarity until victory over Russia. Da wird eben Solidarität bis zum Sieg über Russland gesagt. Darüber wird gesprochen. Also das müsste jetzt alle, wir müssen alle... This is being discussed. So we all need to stand together until we defeat Russia. Now I believe there is hardly any military expert who would even remotely assume that this is still possible. We are essentially talking about something that is completely unrealistic. It is demanded that the member states collectively provide 127 billion euros annually in military goods to Ukraine. That is roughly as much as Ukraine has received from 2022 until now. So an insane increase in military aid to Ukraine, which probably has more of a problem with not having enough soldiers, and so on. That won't happen either. And then, of course, there's the call that all Western weapons can also be used on Russian territory. That's certainly new. Other things are added, like joining NATO is inevitable. You can't do that, they will simply be in NATO. And, of course, the red flag for the Russians, sanctions. They now want to sanction third countries that do that. And then, of course, a special tribunal. All these things, these ten points that we already know from the Zelensky plan, have been presented again, in my opinion, even more strongly. My reaction is, of course, I am familiar with such things. And a bit of it is naturally that something unrealistic has been decided here. The European Union has no influence at all on achieving any of these goals. We don't have the military power to change the war there. We will never raise the 127 billion euros in military aid. Germany has just halved it, and so on. So the NATO membership, I don't see that happening at all, and so on. So something unrealistic is being done. And I think that's the dangerous thing about such a resolution. It provokes, but it does something that is actually no longer enforceable. In my view, the European Union has essentially shot itself in the foot because it has isolated itself from the attempts. There will be a solution. I assume there will probably be a ceasefire before the end of the year, or something will happen, and we might soon have Trump as president, and so on. But the European Union will no longer participate. We've closed all the doors now. We've also appointed Ms. Kallis, who is extremely anti-Russian, as the new foreign representative. Mr. Stoltenberg is currently at the Munich Security Conference. So everywhere we are, closing the doors. Everywhere we are trying to put in people who think this war can still be won. And with that, we are naturally isolating ourselves internationally. Enormously. In America, in my opinion, they have already moved on from the Ukraine war. I was just in New York. The conversation there is completely different from in Germany, probably also in Austria. No one talks about victory. Instead, they are more likely to discuss when it will be time for the Ukrainian army to collapse. Of course, no one will say that officially, but I met many high-ranking people there. So it looks completely different. And then there's BRICS, which isn't mentioned here at all, but the next BRICS summit is in Russia, in Kazan. And they already make up 45% of the world's population and 37% of the world's production or economic output, whereas the EU is only about 5% of the world's population and 14% of the economic output. Ours are going down and theirs are going up. 30 countries have applied to become members, including the NATO country Turkey. This means they will join, and we are well over 50%, and we simply ignore them. And the fact that they are meeting in Russia, when they could have chosen another location because it's at war, says a lot about how we live in a bubble here, and don't even realize that the world around us has changed enormously 
and not in our favor. Dass die Welt um sich um uns herum sich enorm verändert hat und nicht zu unserem Gunsten, ne? Dann ist natürlich das andere. Ja, meine, in vielen Ländern, also gerade in Deutschland. Then there's the other thing. In many countries, especially in Germany, there's a survey showing that 68% of people are against arms deliveries and in favor of negotiations. And this is very, very similar in most EU countries, depending on how the surveys are conducted. So there's a parliament in Strasbourg that has become alienated from reality and an elite that is pro-war and, in my opinion, has completely lost touch with reality. And that is, of course, a dangerous thing, because politics is, after all, the art of the possible. And if you leave that, even in EU, we are no longer strong enough to enforce it. This will harm us incredibly, this type of resolution, this type of policy. It will harm us economically, it will harm us politically. This is a political stupidity. No matter what one thinks about who started the war or who is to blame, these are completely different questions. So we have really put ourselves in an unimaginable situation. This is a completely mindless, irrational policy that we are pursuing. Irrational. There's nothing else to say about it. You've given some keywords, so let's focus on a few. The EU-NATO story is interesting because in reality, even in this resolution we're discussing, I don't know, I haven't counted how often NATO is mentioned and referenced, but as an outsider reading it quickly, you might actually be confused about what the difference is. Does the EU, in its overwhelming majority, see itself differently, as the EU as a NATO member as part of NATO? The resolution also talks about Ukraine's NATO membership. What does Ukraine's NATO membership have to do with the EU? How do you essentially see this? Regarding defense policy and foreign policy, the EU is increasingly questioning its own identity and almost its very basis of existence. Well, I think the EU is not clear at all. I always wonder, what does it actually want? Sometimes you hear talks about how it should connect with NATO. NATO is, so to speak, the military arm of the European Union and so on. On the other hand, you hear, I was just at another EU meeting here, where it's always said that we need to militarize ourselves, have our own army, and who knows what else. Of course, the specter of Trump is behind this. They are all terribly afraid. No one really wants to mention that Trump might become President of the United States again and that the EU would then be left completely alone militarily. Yes, so it's not clear at all. It's not clear at all that this is really the case. So I believe both. NATO and the EU will suffer greatly if this war is truly lost. And I believe it's only a matter of months before this war is lost. And then NATO will have lost another war, even though it still thinks it is the largest military alliance in the world, and of course the EU as well, because we will have to pay the funds. So Trump's vice president just said that Germany, maybe he forgot Austria, they also have to pay, should pay for Ukraine. <laughs> These are hundreds of billions coming our way. Hundreds of billions. I mean, it's complete madness. Peace would become insanely expensive. I don't see that happening at all. It's completely unrealistic. Many war supporters like Poland will protest heavily. They are already saying it can't be because the people who were executed back then in World War II or in between need to be properly buried first, and so on. But behind this, of course, is the fear in Poland that all these agricultural subsidies they receive in large amounts will now be redirected to Ukraine. That's how they see it too, it's completely unclear. I believe the whole politics is unclear. And that's because the principle is irrational. What does the European Union want? And I've experienced many wars. We are constantly talking about emotional, moral things here. Wars are not about morality, they are about interests. And I wonder what interests should the Europeans or the European Union and its member states have in a war with Russia? 
What interest? What do they want to gain from it? So they cut themselves off from resources. They cut themselves off from markets in Asia. They are harming their economy with the sanctions. They have an insane expenditure on weapons there. And now another 50 billion to keep Ukraine alive at all. That will become much more. So it is a completely irrational thing why Europe does not try to create peace on their own continent, or at least make an attempt. They don't want that, not even make the attempt. And that, I believe, is something that will harm us greatly. It will harm us. You cannot behave irrationally in politics. You have to acknowledge reality as it is, and then you can make policy but not like what we are doing there. Well, we noticed this in the various recent national elections, including in Germany again, that in reality people, the eligible voters, are voting and essentially expressing their opinion that they consider this policy to be wrong. The problem is that in Europe, those from whom one actually expected in the past to engage for peace and disarmament, they did so, but that was decades ago, and in reality now, those from whom one would expect this, based on their fundamental programmatic stance, which is still somewhere in their program, are not doing so. So how should things continue in Europe? Where is Europe actually heading after this war, or through this war? In reality, it's moving to the right in Europe. And both of us, I think it's fair to say openly, you are a member of a socialist list. That was quite deliberate, quite deliberate. It's not accidental, right? That's how it is. I believe peace belongs to the left. I'm not a Marxist. That's true for everyone. Who sits in a trench? That will be your worker's son. And who is retired? Who will be diminished? The people who already get 100,000 euros a month. They are the ones suffering here. These representatives who vote here, they get so much money thrown at them, they don't notice anything at all. They neither have a son at war, nor a daughter at war, nor a house being destroyed. We get so much money, we get 350 euros per day, just for being here. Well, I get that now too, when I talk to you here. And that's roughly the income of three months for someone in Ukraine whose son is at war. We need to consider that. And we just vote here for the war to continue and that nothing needs to be done to find a solution. And we create unrealistic stories, war until the end. Well, in the end, Ukraine will be destroyed. And yes, people like us here are doing that. For me, it's shocking. I didn't even experience that in the Iran-Iraq war. Such narrow-mindedness as we have here in the European Parliament. What do you attribute that to? It didn't happen overnight. I believe the Ukraine war is important in the sense that it signals the end of a world dominated by the West. The elites are of course aware of this. These elites like me, who are so internationalized, have benefited greatly from this. They also realize that things will change. You can already see this with the BRICS countries and such developments. You can also see it in the fact that almost no one in the Global South, it's a silly term, Global South, but there's no other word supports us in this whole matter. We are completely isolated with this whole issue, also with our perspective. They see it as a NATO expansion, the war. We see it differently, accusing Putin of imperialism. The others see us as imperialists. So yes, this is naturally an elite that feels threatened. I believe that's true. Mr. Schultz spoke of a turning point. By that he meant that countries at war should now be sent weapons. In reality, a completely different turning point is taking place. This is a turning point where Europe, as a community, is actually only a relatively small community, no longer a superpower, or doesn't even have a chance to become one, right? So a restructuring moment is happening. 
And this is evident in the Ukraine war. That was Afghanistan, which we lost. It was far away, and it could be pushed aside, although it also contributed to it. Das war weit weg, das konnte man auch wegschieben, obwohl es auch dazu beigetragen hat, aber, aber den Ukraine, das kann man nicht mehr wegschieben. Und, um, But the Ukraine war, uh, that Geld, can't be pushed aside also, das, anymore, das, glaub, Menschen, and with the money that it will cost. Fühlen, I believe these are people who deeply feel that what is happening there is not in their favor, but it's just an elite. Well, and people like me, by the way, I just see it differently. But that's simply because I've spent my whole life outside. You know, now, look, imagine you're an Indian or you're from Kenya or whatever, and you see NATO, what do people see there? We say NATO defends our values and blah, 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 blah. What they see is simply a power instrument of the former colonial powers, mainly white colonial powers. That's what they see. So for them, it's not a story of freedom. The Americans have intervened militarily in other countries 251 times in the 30 years between 92 and 22, according to their own statements. We don't read about it, but if you live in those countries, you know about it, and then they just don't want it anymore. That's why they have the meeting in Russia, and not with us or somewhere else. That's just how it is, and we forget that. We act as if we are all alone in the world. If a woman goes there on her own and says these countries are threatened, that they will also be punished if they don't participate in our sanctions, they just laugh about it. We have long since completely lost power over that. We have to act realistically. Well, good or not good? It's not good. Good is just a figure of speech, but actually, as I said, you've recently returned to a large system, this time as a member of a commission, the left, a group that unfortunately belongs to a very strong minority in the European Parliament. What is your strategy? What can actually still be done from the inside to prevent the worst? Or is it already absolutely hopeless? Well, I believe with this vote, the European Parliament has actually, I must say, with a bigger dream, because I am pro-European, I do think we need to come together, we Europeans. It has shown, once again, how unimportant the Parliament actually is, right? You can't pass something unrealistic and then think you're still playing a political role. We've essentially sidelined ourselves. So I think for us here, mainly, I mean, I was the first to write about this reduction at all. No major newspaper wrote about it. So if I hadn't done it, it would have been completely lost, even though it would bring great disadvantages for all of us. The reporting for me, it's important that we are here in Parliament, that we tell the people who want peace, mainly in Germany for me. Yes, you have a few people who at least pay a little attention, who still talk a bit. And then, of course, I send these newsletters to all the various peace organizations in Germany, sharing my assessment, and so on. And that is actually quite well received. So when I go around, I actually have a full soul, people come in and so on. Now I supported the demonstration on May 3rd. We have to see how many people come. I believe the era of large demonstrations like we had in the 80s, we won't have anymore. But what I think is much more important today, and we have this with Sarah Wagenknecht's party, is that we have a party that, to use the words of others, is uncompromisingly for peace. And of course also in Gaza and such matters. So we say no negotiating arms exports, just as it is stated in the UN Charter. We stand for international law, for proper international law. I know the UN Charter quite well. I've practically slept with it under my pillow for almost 30 years. And yes, of course, when you're at war, it's the UN Charter. You have to understand that somehow, right? Yes. And now a new party is emerging. What's remarkable is that we only have this phenomenon in Germany. In Austria, for example, you don't have it. You don't have a BSW, do you? 
Now, people from the SPO have contacted me and so on, but sorry, but it doesn't really exist. And if you think about it, in France, if you're against the war, then you have to vote for Le Pen. And Hollande wants that. And the Italians, they now have a government with particularly traditional European values. Miss Maloney is successful, except in Europe. We are already an exception there. I believe it is incredibly important that we as a party succeed, which is not easy at all. We've only been around for six, seven months. Now we have 15% in these countries, or around 15%. All of this has to be organized. You don't do something like that overnight. It's an enormously difficult story, but I do hope that we succeed. My task is, perhaps also due to my background, to reach out a bit more to people who think conservatively, but from the left side, not from the other side, and to say this is for all of us. So now, for the first time, a CDU mayor in a small town in Germany has invited me to speak at the town hall, a CDU man. And of course, I also have contacts with many SPD people. They are also dissatisfied, especially in Spain and so on. So we need to see if we can form a larger alliance. And that this experience, that a party like Sarah Wagenknecht's, despite everything, we don't have any money for campaigning or anything like that. I mean, I pay for everything out of my own pocket. Now, of course, I would be pumped with money here, with the EU. That's the EU, which in my opinion is a terrible money waster. So I much prefer the UN, which has no money or little money. But here, everything is really thrown at you, and compared to that. So, of course, we do most of this privately. And those are all the supporters we have. They all do it voluntarily. Nevertheless, we have such good results in Saxon, Thuringia, and now also in Brandenburg. And it is apparently natural that this is also spreading to the West. There is, of course, still this division between East and West, but we'll have to see. Yes, I believe we should conclude the conversation for today. We have also reached the time we usually reserve for such discussions. But the point made at the end was, I think, important, the indication that this will certainly not be the last conversation we have. You lived in Austria until recently, which means you also have a connection to Austria, and our magazine International collaborates across borders, so we will undoubtedly well, I still live in Austria, my main residence is still in Austria, and I want to say, because you might be listening, that we really enjoy being in Austria, always feel very welcome there, and find it absolutely great. And we also think it's great, the country is quite well organized, so when you drive in Germany and so on, we think the Austrians aren't doing so badly. We always complain, but we're not doing so badly. We really like it there. And you can always talk to me about it. I have a lot of appreciation for Austria. This is precisely the final announcement for further discussions. Internationally, we will also have Michael von der Schulenberg writing and speaking for us in Brussels and Strasbourg in our printed magazine. It is important that we acknowledge and repeatedly hear that there are also people who think differently than what is currently more widely spread in the mainstream, both politically and journalistically. Europe is not completely lost yet, let's say that. No, no, no. I have four children and four grandchildren, so I have to be positive, right? All the best, yes, thank you. If you value our translations, please consider supporting us on Patreon. The link is in the description. Thank you very much.